Members, it's time for questions to the Minister for Finance, Nicole Harry Harvey. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. That will be question number one, Minister. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, when the Back in Business scheme was last in place during 2022-23, 101 businesses benefited from the 50% rate reduction support, the majority of which were small independent retailers. This helped businesses get started, supported jobs and got long-term vacant units back into use. Given the positive impact the Back in Business scheme had in the past, I am glad to advise that legislation to restore this scheme will be made later this month to allow debate at the Assembly. The Committee have now cleared relevant policy stage associated with the measure. I believe reinstating this popular scheme is more important now than ever before to allow new businesses to emerge and to grow our tax base. Mr Harvey. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank you for your answers, Minister. Um, my question was in light of the current climate. Had you plans to reintroduce the scheme? So um, I'll just say uh, that that is good news to hear that later in the month, and it will be helping the small businesses. Thank you. Minister. I, I thank the member for, for his support. Um, it is a, it's a, an important scheme, and it gives 50 per cent reduction to businesses for, um, for, in terms of their rates for up to you two years if they move into premises that were previously used for retail purposes. So it has the um, ability to get some of those premises on our high streets back into use by businesses and to give them that, that space uh, to get started up. Nicola Brogan. Could the Minister outline um, who is eligible for the Back to Business uh, scheme, please? Minister. Yeah, so, um, as I was saying to Mr Harvey, um, the, the um, businesses are eligible if they move into a premises which was previously used for retail purposes and which has been unoccupied for 12 months or more. Um, the previous finance minister amended the scheme in April 2021, extending the duration of support from 12 to 24 months, helping to give businesses additional certainty. Um, this will be retained when the scheme is reintroduced. Colin Tennyson. Speaker. Minister. <clears throat> the rate system and rates relief have been subject to public consultation, review, reform and revision in 2007, 2012, 2016, 2017, 2019 and most recently this year. A number of changes have already been implemented from these reviews. More frequent revaluations have been introduced. The back in business and re rural ATM schemes were reintroduced. A new legislation was made to enable councils to strike different levels of household and business rates. In addition, the Department has also previously availed of the impartial advice, advice garnered from the Ulster University Economic Policy Centre, including the targeting of COVID-19 rate support and a comparative study of domestic rates against council tax. The UUEPC is also undertaking work on business rate poundage differentials across council areas in the next few months. I am open to ideas from any quarter on how to realign the existing generous suite of rate supports, including from members of the Assembly and the Fiscal Commission. I am not sure an expensive external review would be the best use of the limited resources available to the Executive at this time. I will want to use the findings of the most recent consultation to inform further work around how to best align the rate system with the strategic priorities of the executive. It is also, as I have said on a number of occasions, essential as part of this process to grow our tax base to moderate the overall tax burden. Mr. Tennyson. I thank the Minister for her response. The Minister has made reference to the Department's uh, Business Rates Review consultation in 2019, in which a number of consultees said that they believed a more holistic review of rates release was needed and also to the Economic Policy Centre from Ulster University, which advises her department, which has also made a similar suggestion. Is the Minister saying that she disagrees with their view, just to be clear? Minister. So, as, as I've said, um, I plan to use the consultation responses that were recently submitted on the um, revenue raising uh, consultation to inform the, um, my analysis um, and to make some uh, or to consider a uh, potential reform of the rating system going forward. Um, and that's a piece of work, as I've said, that um, I will welcome the views from, from any quarters um, in respect of 
um, uh, informing how we move forward. I think it's, um, it's important that, uh, that we look at how we can best align what we are trying to achieve in, in terms of our social and economic priorities with our rating system, and that's something that I'm keen to do going forward. Deirdre Hager. Minister, um, to detail any plans that she has to review the non-domestic rating system? So the system of business rates has already been subject to public consultation, review and reform, as I have said, um, on a number of occasions over the past couple of decades. I have advised my officials that I want to in explore ideas about how we can best align rate support with the strategic priorities of the executive and to grow the tax base, which is essential, as I've said, to moderating our overall tax burden. Matthew Hill. So you've just said twice that you want to grow the tax base, but you've also said that you don't want a fundamental review of the rating system. Can I ask, just in simple terms, where you think we, how we should grow the tax base and where we should be generating additional revenue from? So I think it's important that we, when we're looking at the rating system, we're also looking at the, the economic vision that the economy minister has outlined about supporting businesses to grow, to create jobs, to get new businesses into to premises and having them contributing to our, our rating system. That, that's what we will want to be able to do in terms of aligning our, our social and economic priorities with our, 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 um, our limited powers that we have in terms of, of raising revenue, uh, mostly in terms of the rating system. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, question three, please, the Minister. Minister. So, unfortunately, the British Government's position on whether it will continue funding the Shared Prosperity Fund beyond March 2025 is not yet clear. Um, I fully understand the anxiety of those in the voluntary and community sector that rely on this funding to support the vitally important work that they do. My officials have been pressing their counterparts in the Department for levelling up housing and communities and Treasury for clarity on this, and I intend raising this matter at um, ministerial le uh, level um, in, in the coming time. I will also be stressing the need to learn the lessons from the delayed implementation of the Shared Prosperity Fund here when it was first established. Mr. Donnelly. Thank you, uh, the Minister, for your answer there. Um, there have been concerns in the way that the funding has been provided. Uh, for example, the money is released every three months in arrears, which creates instability for many organisations. Uh, what assurance can the Minister give that beyond March 2025 that the system that will be in place will be more efficient and more effective? So, I think there are a number of lessons that need to be learned in terms of the, the rollout of the Shared Prosperity Fund. As the Member will be aware, we have also made the case in relation to to how the British government do that centrally, and, and rather than it coming through us as an executive and being able to align the uh, funding that is delivered to our priorities to the programme for government, to the, the things that the executive wants to achieve more broadly. And I think all of these lessons need to be learned, and we will be making that case to, to the Treasury in, in respect of how we move forward beyond 20, March 2025. Patrick I can't call you out. Does the Minister agree that the Shared Prosperity Fund would be much more effective in addressing need if it was delivered directly by departments here? Yes, it is a short answer, but the previous Finance Minister and the Executive argued that the replacement for EU funds should be delivered by local departments and not from Whitehall. This would have enabled us to ensure that uh, that funding was aligned with our priorities. Unfortunately, the British Government did not agree with this approach. However, my department has worked closely with the Department for the Economy to secure funding from the Shared Prosperity Fund through commissions from DLUC to DFE and its um, arm's length bodies. Funding worth £17 million has been secured uh, via this route. This commissioning approach has allowed funding to flow through established structures for the delivery of these local interventions. And while that is not perfect, it is a welcome development and it is one that I hope can be built on um, for future funding. Mr. Speaker, Dairy Women's Centre, Dairy Youth and Community Workshop have been victims of this flawed funding. Uh, Minister, what steps are you taking to ensure that we can undo the damage that has been done within our communities? Minister. So the, the member will be aware that um, Shared Prosperity Fund and replacement for EU funding fell far short of what was delivered. Um, by your EU funding through ESF and ERDF. 
Um, the Shared Prosperity Fund in totality was £127 million over three years. Um, the equivalent EU structural funds averaged out at £65 million per annum. So, obviously, there is a considerable um, shortfall there. Uh, we also lost some funds that was uh, repurposed as part of the financial package. So I think it's important that moving forward we, we um, make the case that the EU structural funds need to be fully restored in terms of that amount and beyond, because obviously there were, there's a seven-year commitment there in terms of EU funding, and we are only uh, three years in terms of the shared prosperity fund. So we need to continue to collectively make that case to the British Treasury that that funding needs to be properly restored. Mike Nesbitt. Where what percentage of the fund comes to Northern Ireland, and specifically if it matches the three percent of the population who reside here? Mr. So we have made the case at the time um, when the member will be aware, obviously, that we did better, I suppose, in terms of the drawdown of EU funds compared to the Barnet consequential, for example, that we would get. Uh, so I'm not entirely sure of the, the percentage that we get, but it's something that I will ask officials to write to the member about. Paula Bradshaw. Uh, work in relation to the commitment in the new decade new approach document focused on how future registrations might be made in Irish, providing retrospective certificates in Irish would require careful legal and technical consideration and appropriate resources. The Department will consider how best to address these questions alongside other ambitions to progress the use of Irish in the registration services provided. Ms. Bradshaw. Um, thank you, Minister, for your answer. This is obviously off the back of an, uh, a written question, written response that you provided to me, and I appreciate the, the extra information you've given to me today there. Um, but have we costed out how much this is going to cost and whether there's a time scale? I have some constituents who would be very keen to see their um, birth certificate in Irish. Thank you. Minister. So the, the Department is continuing to do work in terms of the rollout of, of registrations in Irish. I, I recently met with Conor Nagele as well in relation to um, meeting our, our commitments in um, respect of the Irish language. So work is ongoing um, in respect of how we can meet the, the, um, the, the commitments that we have made, but also to look at some of the other issues as well. Um, we're in a strange position at the moment where you can have a birth certificate in Irish, you can have your uh, death certificate in Irish, but we still can't get a will in Irish. Would the Minister advise just what steps will be taken to provide that, please? Minister. Yeah, so the Department of Finance does not hold the legislative authority in relation to wills. Um, I'm engaging with my executive colleagues to ensure this new decade new approach <coughs> commitment is appropriately led and taken forward. And I've written to the Justice Minister to ask if the Department of Justice, working with its agencies such as the courts and tribunal services, will take responsibility for progressing this issue, which relates to the repeal of the Administration of Justice um, Act and the issue of wills and probate, which falls under their remit. Can, can the Minister tell us how many registrations or re-registrations that have taken place in Irish under the new legislation? Minister. Since um, the option for births, marriages and deaths to be registered with the choice of the certificate headings in Irish or bilingual or English was introduced on the 11th of March 2022. There has been 4,934 bilingual birth registrations and 92 Irish registrations, um, 1,164 bilingual death registrations and 25 Irish registrations, uh, 1,382 bilingual marriage or civil partnership registrations and 17 Irish registrations. These figures also include the, the re-registrations, and I expect, as the changes to the system continues to bed in, this will increase over time. Jerry Carl. So, as the member will be aware from briefings at the Finance Committee, there are strict rules regarding the award of public contracts. There are currently no grounds under the public contracts regulations, which would exclude Fujitsu 
from tendering for public contracts. The Minister for Mr. Answer. Um, Minister, you'll be aware through the Horizon scandal, this company has destroyed people's lives across these islands and driven some to suicide. Uh, we have to ask serious questions about Fujitsu and companies like them, and the scandal has been known about for many uh, for years. Uh, I would suggest your department and officials need to take action. They have some 775 million contracts in total, so Fujitsu have destroyed people's lives, but it's been handsomely paid by departments in this build building. Completely unacceptable. Um, I'm not sure there's a question there, but uh, you might want to respond. Yeah, and, and I think um, we are all appalled by the Horizon scandal and the impact that it's had on, on those who have been directly affected and their families. Um, as, I, as I said in my original answer, um, the, the, uh, the awarding of public contracts is, is obviously bound in legislation, and as it stands, um, there are no grounds under the, the public contracts reg re regulations. Obviously, there is a public inquiry ongoing, and we will um, await the outcome of that. Declan Kearney. Uh, Minister, can you expand on the circumstances under which um, suppliers can be excluded from uh, the awarding of uh, government contracts? and the extent to which public interest, public ethics and human rights will influence that process, please. Minister. So a, a supplier may only be excluded from tendering for government contracts if they have committed an offence under the legislation listed in the public contracts regulations. This legislation relates to offences committed mainly in regard to theft, bribery, fraud, organised crime, professional misconduct, labour market offences, tax offences or breaches of con uh, competition law. At this stage, Fujitsu obviously has not been found guilty of, of any of those um, crimes in relation to fraud or other crimes related to Horizon, and therefore there are no grounds as it stands for their exclusion from tendering for public contracts. Due to the ongoing involvement in the inquiry, uh, Fujitsu has agreed to pause uh, bidding for public contracts for new um, clients. On the, on the 18th of January 2024, the local Fujitsu account manager provided um, cl some clarifications uh, to the Department of Finance regarding their involvement in procurement here. Um, and that position is likely un to remain unchanged until the inquiry has reported, um, and the inquiry is scheduled to conclude in September 2024, with a report to follow later in the year. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, when will the Minister bring forward a review of public procurement following the publication of the Northern Ireland Audit Office report um, in April last year? I also note that in response to an Assembly written question by myself, you had indicated that your department was finalising the terms of reference. So, are we to believe that that would be imminent? Um, our Minister. So, in um, April 2023, the Audit Office published a report on its review of public procurement um, structures here. The report recognises the importance of public procurement as an enabling function for departments to deliver essential public services and highlights the need to ensure procurement functions effectively to achieve value for money and to align with broader executive uh, priorities. The report discusses the key role and responsibilities assigned to procurement board under um, existing public procurement policies and concluded that a review of public procurement arrangements is necessary including the role, responsibilities and composition of the Procurement Board. I am considering the report and will bring my recommendations on the Procurement Board and a review of procurement governance to the Executive uh, for consideration before summer recess. Tom Elliott. Uh, I am just seeking clarification from the Minister uh, in something she said in, an, in answer to Mr Kearney, and that is that Fujitsu would not be bidding for any further public contracts, is that correct? And is that in Northern Ireland? And if so, how long is that for? Minister. So, the, uh, new contracts with new customers um, is my understanding in, in relation to, um, to the, the current situation in relation to Fujitsu, so where they already have contracts with an organisation or are involved in um, a bidding process. That, that will continue. And as I said, there are no grounds at this stage to exclude um, them from that process. Mark Durkin. Mr. Uh, Speaker, 
So just for clarity then, should a company that is found guilty of any or all of the offences uh, listed by the Minister, there are no implications for existing contracts? Minister. So obviously there are issues, there are legal issues in respect of the delivery of contracts, um, and the, the, the position would be in respect of uh, new contracts. Um, I will write to the member with details as to the specifics of the, the regulations um, outlining public procurement and contracts in respect of that. Alan Chambers. Question six, Minister. The Executive recognises the need for fiscal sustainability and, as part of a new fiscal framework, will want to look at all options to deliver efficiencies, generate revenue, enhance borrowing powers and examine fiscal devolution. The main revenue-raising measures which fall within my department's remit is the regional rate. The Executive recommended a 4 per cent increase in the regional rate for 2024-25, which the Assembly passed on 12 March 2024 during the rates debate. This should be seen as a clear demonstration the Executive recognises the need uh, to deliver high quality public services and to ensure our finances are on a more sustainable footing. Mr Chambers. The uh, Fiscal Council and the Fiscal Commission conducted detailed analysis and presented several outcomes. Has the Minister discarded these? And if so, what does she plan to do to cover the growing fiscal gap? Minister. So, um, I, obviously, uh, there are um, a number of measures that were put forward for the, by the Secretary of State for um, consultation while the executive uh, was still down. Um, departments will be in receipt of the responses to those um, in, in the next short while, and, and certainly I will be considering the outworkings of the consultation in, um, in respect of rates. We asked as part of the consultation uh, on the kind of general um, finances for the North, uh, if there are other revenue measures that can be uh, considered, that's something obviously we'll consider in respect of um, the responses received. Obviously, you know, we don't want to be in a situation where we're putting more regressive charges on the backs of workers and families who are already struggling with the cost of living. We do have a significant challenge in terms of our budgetary situation. We will continue to make the case to the British Treasury and to the British Government to be properly funded, to have a properly baselined uh, funding uh, framework on the basis of need. Um, that, that has been recognised that we have been underfunded over the last number of years. We, have, we need to, going forward, be properly funded to be able to deliver the type of high-quality public services people deserve. David <clears throat> Honeyford. Hi, thank you. Um, Mr Speaker, when will the Minister bring forward her paper on physical, uh, physical de devolution to the Executive? So, um, I, and obviously, we are working through the budget process at the minute, so there's a, a good bit on the, the plate as the Department, but it is something that I want to bring forward to the Executive in the near future. I think it's important as part of the negotiations that we are going to have with Treasury about a future fiscal framework that we have in a, an agreed um, executive position around the type of powers that we would be looking to seek as part of that. So it's something that we'll be um, progressing in the next short while. Gerald Brownlee. Mr. Speaker, question eight. Yes, sir. Um, I recognise the vital role of non-teaching staff and the crucially important contribution they make to the education of our children and young people. My department has provided expenditure approval for the implementation of the non-teaching staff pay and grading review on 3 April 2024. It will now be for the Department of Education to ensure the affordability of the measures before implementation. Ms Brownlee. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, could the Minister confirm if the business case um, that has been approved will be provided for the meeting on the 18th of April for the unions? Sure. I would assume that that will be a matter for the, the Education Minister. My department has approved the business case, approved the expenditure for the implementation of the pay and grading review. It will obviously be for the Education Minister now to take that forward to ensure that the um, measures that is being pro proposed are affordable to be implemented. Paul McGrath. 
Um, has the Minister had any meetings with the Minister for Health to try and secure additional funding for nursing staff following the RCN's decision to turn down the Executive's pay offer? Minister. So I've been involved in um, bilateral meetings with all of my executive colleagues as part of the budgetary process um, and discussed the various challenges that, have, that face each of the departments and each of the ministers. Um, and it, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to go into the individual bids at this point, obviously, because there's a process still to, to go through. Um, but I, I can assure um, the member that obviously all departments are facing significant challenges and significant pressures, and um, we will have some difficult decisions to make in the, in the weeks ahead in respect of the budget. Danny Becker. <coughs> can I ask the Minister why there was a delay in providing approval for the business case for non teaching staff pay award? Minister. Um, my officials at every stage of the process worked at pace to complete the review of the information and reach a judgment on whether it was sufficient to enable expenditure approval. Unfortunately, this review identified at several stages that the information provided to my department contained significant errors and, and was incomplete. I'm sure that you would agree that decisions involving very significant levels of expenditure cannot be made on the basis of incorrect or inadequate information, so approval was provided as soon as the information was confirmed as being accurate and robust. Call the question number nine. Question number nine. Minister. Um, I am committed to ensuring my department follows best practice in relation to its Section 75 duties, not only in considering the equality impacts of its own spending decisions but also in respect of the wider budget process. The gender impact of budget proposals should be captured as part of the equality impact assessment information requested from departments as part of the budget process and provided to the executive to inform its decisions. However, I have asked my officials to consider what more can be done in relation to gender budgeting. Ms. Killen. So I suppose the question I would have following your response would be what consideration, if any, can be given to ensure the gender budget and process can be improved? Minister. Um, well, I have written, uh, I suppose, to my executive colleagues as part of the budget process for 2024-25, setting out the um, approach to our quality considerations. Going forward, I plan to engage fully with the Equality Commission on how we can improve equality considerations as part of that wider process. Um, I also, as I have said, want to fully consider how gender budgeting requirements can be better reflected. Um, to that end, I am meeting a, a number of, um, of the organisations that have expertise in respect of gender budgeting and, and who have carried out extensive um, research in this area. Another important step in improving consideration towards uh, gender in budgets is the development of the executive's uh, social inclusion strategies, including the gender equality strategy. This will allow departments to table budget proposals in line with the priorities in these strategies. And obviously, work in social inclusion strategies is being led uh, by the Department for Communities and, and, and is a priority for the executive. Jerry Kelly. Minister. The spring budget announced by the Chancellor on the 6th of March provided 99.4 million of additional resource Dell uh, Barnet consequentials for the executive in 2024-25. This is based on the current Barnet formula, which will need to be updated to reflect the new 124% as part of the restoration package. I have sought and received assurances from the Chief Secretary to the Treasury on this. I am also keen to see negotiations begin on the wider fiscal framework. This must include ensuring that the executive receives an appropriate level of funding based on need. Mr. Kelly. Uh, uh, does the Minister believe these uh, bonnet consequences must include the 24 per cent uh, needs based factor? Sir. The financial package that accompanied restoration um, of the executive was clear that from 2024 25, any uplifts to um, the executive's uh, Dell budget through the Barnett formula would attract a 24 per cent needs based factor. Therefore, it has to be applied to the consequential received in the spring budget. 
As I said, um, I sought and have been given assurances by the Chief Secretary to the Treasury that Treasury will work at pace with us over coming weeks to agree that underlying, underlying methodology for the application of the formula, and my officials have already begun engagement with Treasury officials on this. I move to topical questions. I call Matthew Taylor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, first of all, I declare an interest as a parent at a school affected, but um, I asked yourself and the Education Minister two separate questions about the date on which uh, you were informed that the UK Government had removed the ring fence from Fresh Start. Uh, he said he was informed by you that the ring fence had been removed on the 13th of February. You said that you informed him and other executive colleagues on the 5th of March 2024. Which of you is correct, and who made the decision to remove funding from integrated schools? Minister. So the, the response to the written question that the member will have received will reflect the co official correspondence that we received from Treasury in respect of the financial package and any monies that have been on ring fence. So that is the date that the uh, member is referring to in, re in respect of my response. Um, I'm, I'm not. I can't answer for the education minister as to. Um, what uh, correspondence that he is, um, is referring to. Obviously, the, as we have said on previous occasion, the decision in respect of unring fence and of any monies was taken by the Treasury, not the Executive, um, and th therefore the, we are left dealing with the consequences of that. Mr. Hill. Um, Minister, you said you have left dealing with the consequences of the removal of the ring fence, but one of the, remo the consequences is not that the executive has to remove money. It's really important to nail this myth. A ring fence being removed does not remove the money from those schools. That was a decision made by the executive. Was it made by the education minister, or was it made by yourself in conjunction with the education minister? It's really important that we be precise about this. Removing the ring fence does not cut the funding. That was a decision that the executive made. Mr. Uh, minister. So I understand the member is referring to the 150 million of fresh start uh, funding, um, and I, I understand. And obviously, again, I can't speak on behalf of the education minister, but I understand that the 10 integrated schools were uh, placed as part of the Department for Education's um, capital programme. And as the member will know, uh, the executive agreed to um, to earmark funding for the the school campus. Um, the on ring fence funding in terms of the financial capital has been made available to the executive as resource, not capital money. So it's all there within the package. And we have considerable um, challenges and pressures faced in our resource budget. So it will be for the executive to decide how to allocate funding um, as part of the budget process. Jim Allister. Section 64, subsection 1 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998 is very clear. It says the Minister of Finance shall, before the beginning of each financial year, lay before the Assembly a draft budget. Has the Minister considered the legal consequences of her flagrant breach of the statutory duty that the law places upon her? Minister. The Member will be aware of the, um, the challenges facing the Assembly and Executive in current terms of the, the time frame in respect of the budget for this for the last financial year and also for this financial year. The member will also be aware that the same section of the, the 1998 Act requires that I lay a statement um, to the Assembly after I've been informed by the Secretary of State of the funding for the fin incoming financial year, and I, and I have done that prior to Easter. M Mr. Allister. not answered the question. What are the legal consequences of her flagrant breach of the statutory duty under Section 64.1 to lay a budget? And what example is it to our citizens if we say to them, the minister can defy the law, but you must obey the law that this assembly makes? Minister. So I have clearly laid out the time frame as to, um, as to when I intend to, to lay a budget before the assembly. Um, I have set it out in terms of um, the number of debates that we have had in respect of the budget since the assembly and executive was restored. Obviously, these are not ideal circumstances. I've been very upfront about that. Um, but we have to deal with the circumstances that we, we are in, and we will be working at pace to bring a budget in coming weeks. Uh, Michelle Michelvin. I ask the Minister if, if she intends to bring forward legislation pursuant to the recommendations of the 2011 Northern Ireland Law Commission report 
to allow limited contracting out of the business tenancies in Northern Ireland Order 1996? Minister. Uh, if the member is agreeable with the member, I, I will write to her in response to that particular question. I come from left, from left field, um, but and I would also appreciate it probably if she could write to me on this one as well. If she has any intention to bring forward legislation to bring into law the recommendations of the Northern Ireland Law Commission following its review in 2013, um, and this is in relation to apartments to address the problems experienced by those owning and living in, apart living in apartments and other properties with elements of shared ownership. And Mr. Speaker, um, if you don't mind. I'll declare an interest as someone who owns an apartment. Minister. There has been, I assume she's talking about management in, in respect of those properties, so there has been some scoping work initially undertaken to introduce um, legislation to give freeholders on private and mixed tenure estates equivalent rights to leaseholders. No further work has been progressed in the interim due to budgetary constraints constraints faced by my department. The regulation of property management companies is a policy area which is of interest to a number of departments um, and in coming weeks I will be engaging with officials to assess how the issue can be addressed in the context obviously of the competing priorities and, and available resources. Trevor Clark. Um, can I ask the Minister, and I'm sure the Minister will be aware, like the rest of us, many of our towns and villages are suffering from dereliction in terms of the buildings and buildings with the dereliction that actually affects the neighbouring businesses. Have you any plans to bring forward any support for those businesses that are owned or the properties that are owned to actually bring them back into good use? Um, well, one of the uh, initiatives I suppose that we, we have taken is the, the Back in Business Scheme, which um, aims to bring properties that have been out of use that were previously for retail use to be, um, to be brought back into use for businesses and to get it gives uh, rates relief to businesses for 50 per cent for up to two years. That was an initiative that had um, previously been in place and which uh, through the High Street Task Force work and the, the previous mandate was recommended that we would bring forward again. I think there is an important piece of work in respect of how we get our towns and villages um, in, and get businesses into them and using those spaces and have different I guess, uses for those spaces as well in terms of, of housing in town centres and, and other recreation spaces. So there is a, a piece of work there. Obviously in respect of my own department and um, the rating system, there, there's some measures that potentially could be looked at as part of that uh, broader um, strategic look at the reform of rates. Mr. Clark, uh, and thank the Minister for the answer. And given, I mean, there is financial restrictions on many of the people who own those properties, and many of them cost tens of thousands, of hundreds of thousands, to bring back. So, I suppose, really, what I'm trying to get from you, Minister, is that you've, well, you have plans or otherwise to bring forward a financial package, to, and a meaningful financial package, so that these, business, these businesses and these premises could be bought and brought back into use. So some of that will be would fall to me in terms of my remit. Obviously, some of it will fall to other ministers, including the communities minister and the economy minister, in terms of, of their priorities for their departments and the, the responsibilities they have. So I will consider any um, any proposals that other ministers will bring forward in respect of that. Linda Dill. Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister. Minister, can you confirm if your department is considering the potential of bringing forward? Um, the issuing of baby loss certificates? Minister. Obviously, this is um, an issue which. Um, sorry, I, I do have a response here in respect to of baby loss certificates. Just give me a wee second to find it. Sorry, I've lost my. Answer. But obviously, it is an issue that is, is um, one that is very sensitive, and it's something that I have asked officials to take a look at. Um, obviously, we, we want to be able to give recognition to, to parents. We want to be able to consider the issue fully. Thank you, Minister. And as, if you say, as you've said, this is a very sensitive issue for any family who have lost a child, and it is really important to those parents, to those families, that there is a recognition of the loss of their child and the fact that their child existed. So can you confirm that the responsibility for the issuing of baby loss certificates would come under your particular department and that it is something that, if it is possible for you to do, you would do retrospectively for those parents who have already suffered the loss of a child? 
Minister. So I'm aware that the, um, the Health Minister is also looking into the issue and that he is engaging with um, officials in the Department of Health in, in England in respect of the, the baby loss certificate scheme that they have put in place. Um, so I will be reaching out to the Health Minister to, to look at um, where we can work together to bring forward um, appropriate measures that would uh, do the same here. Um, obviously, if I have asked my officials to look at this uh, uh, already in respect of the responsibilities that my department has, but clearly it's one where we, we would have to look across departments as well. Paul Frey has withdrawn his question, so I call Mr John Blair. Mr Speaker, can I ask the Minister how she intends to incorporate climate considerations into the budget process? Minister. So obviously, um, we have... Uh, we are going through the budget process at the minute, so departments will be making their various bids um, as part of the, the budget process. Um, the Department for Agriculture, Rural Affairs, Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs is also working through the, the Climate Action Plan um, process at the minute um, and the consultations in respect of that. So departments will have various bids that I'm sure they will, will make in, in respect of the, those going forward. Mr. Blair. Uh, Mr Speaker, I thank the Minister for that reply. And related to climate considerations, can I ask what strategic support and leadership the Department is providing to meet the requirements of the Climate Change Act as set out in the Department's business plan? Minister. So, so um, obviously all departments will have obligations under the, the new climate legislation and we have been um, working uh, closely with the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs in respect of our responsibilities and, and in respect of the responsibilities of the executive more broadly um, in terms of, of climate and it's something that will be a significant piece of work for all departments in, in, in the coming months and years. Kelly Armstrong. Speaker, um, could I ask the Minister to confirm when legislation will be put in place to um, put the, the Northern Ireland Fiscal Council on a statutory footing um, and bring it to the Assembly? So this is a, a piece of work that um, the Department has been working on while the um, institutions were down um, and which we will be looking to bring forward and to progress um, in, in the near future. Specific timings at this stage need to be firmed up. Um, I am seeking to progress and to put it on, onto the Assembly's legislative programme as soon as possible. An executive paper is being prepared for this purpose to seek agreement to proceed. Um, significant property work, as I said, ha has been undertaken. Um, the former finance minister had circulated a draft document to ministerial colleagues um, and to the NIO to seek initial views. Officials are um, continuing to engage uh, with the offices of Legislative Council. Um, who had agreed to begin work on the uh, Fiscal Council Bill while the institutions were down uh, at risk um, to develop the legislation, given it was a new decade, new approach commitment, um, and they continue to provide um, advice and assistance in terms of the, the policy development. Colin Gillard, new. Kelly, sorry, Kelly Orr. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, related to this, Minister, um, would you consider including within the statutory remit of the Fiscal Council an assessment of the cost of division within Northern Ireland and the effect this has on public services following yesterday's successful motion? Minister. So, um, as part of the, uh, the, uh, the Fiscal Council Bill, that's not something that I will be um, putting into the, the Bill. Obviously, the Fiscal Council will have um, the ability to set its own work programme and uh, to do work within the scope of the, the kind of broad um, remit that it will be given in respect of the, the legislation. Gormy Hoggett, uh, Minister, you attended the North South Ministerial Council yesterday, and that is indeed to be welcomed. Can you give us your assessment, please, of the benefits of the North South Ministerial Council? Minister. Um, well, obviously, it was good that the, um, the institutions of the, the Good Friday Agreement are back in place and that we do have the North South Ministerial Council back up and working. Um, it gives an important forum to have that all-island um, cooperation and, and collaboration um, across a number of areas. Obviously, I have specific responsibility for the SEUPB um, and there's some really important work obviously being rolled out and SEUPB has done, um, has done a really good job while the institutions have been down and, and continuing to implement its work programme. Uh, Mr. Uh, 
Concordia. Uh, Minister, could you provide you have touched on there the SEU? Could you give us an update on Peace Plus, please? Minister. So, um, as the member will know, uh, Peace Plus is worth approximately £1 billion. It will build on the work of the pre previous peace programmes and also interreg programmes, um, promoting economic and social exclusion, inclusion um, and peace and prosperity across uh, the north and the border counties. Um, it originally opened or officially opened for funding calls on the 15th of June 2023. 19 funding calls have opened for applications with 13 subsequently closed. Work on opening calls, assessing projects and taking funding decisions will obviously continue apace throughout the rest of, of the year. Uh, since December, the steering committees have taken decisions to award approximately £207 million of Peace Plus funding to successful project applications across several investment areas. Um, this will include, and the member will have seen the announcement um, uh, today, of the £143.5 million for the Belfast Dublin Enterprise train upgrade, £40 million pounds for um, youth programmes, £11.3 million pounds to local community action plans and £11.3 million to shared education programmes. That concludes the questions to the Minister for Finance. We now move to, uh, back to the motion on the spring supplementary estimates. And I call, uh, John